Hi everyone, my name's Declan McGlynn. Welcome to Friday Forum Live, Point Blank's weekly broadcast, bringing you exclusive tutorials, industry insight, and artist interviews every single Friday, live from East London. Today we're really excited to be joined by Cy Medway Smith to take a look at some of the more advanced Ableton mixing techniques. So today we're going to take a look at live and its mixing features, including thickening up your drums, mixing using Ableton's racks and the all-important glue compressor. And remember, we are live and interactive, so put your questions in the comments and we'll get to them at the end of the broadcast. But this is Sai's first FFL, so just go easy on him, all right? How you doing, man? Hey, good, Welcome thanks. to the FFL yeah. chasm. <laughs> so what have you got with us today? It's um, a got, new project. Uh, yeah, it's a new project, new artist called Charlie Brown. It's, uh, it's going to be his single. Right, OK. Next single, first his, single. His first single Exciting. ever. And it's something that I've written in Ableton, recorded in Ableton, and mixed in Ableton wow. the whole way. All from a lot of people finish. kind of, you hear a lot of people writing in different DAWs, moving things around throughout yeah. the, the conveyor belt of mixing, as it were. But uh, yeah. So you just stick from the very start all the way through to the end? I do now. Okay. Yeah, so you didn't, you didn't previously? Um, probably a couple of years ago now, I just started working exclusively mm -hmm. in Ableton. Um, yeah, I used to use different things for, for certain stuff, but now since Live 9, it seems to, to have it all okay. in one place yeah that's good yeah so uh, maybe we could take a listen then to the, the sure. track just to get a bit of a put it in context yeah before yeah. we start yeah it's uh, it's a track called push and shove uh, it's 155 bpm yes. here it is Come to push and shove. Nobody's gonna love you. One. So it's kind of like yeah. a drum and bassy with some poppier elements. And... Exactly that. It's okay. yeah, accessible pop <laughs> yeah. drum and bass. Yeah, I um, I've been the MD for Rudimental for a couple of years, okay. and uh, I'd say that's kind of where they they fall into that category of exactly of pop, but with some element of the underground still. Okay. Um, so how do you approach a mix like this? Is this something that starts off as a demo, maybe on an um, acoustic instrument, and then you start writing it exactly. with electronic elements? That's exactly how this track started. It was on a... Charlie came to me with a hook uh, on an acoustic guitar. Okay. And um, it actually started off on the half-time tempo. Right. As, as, yeah, a guitar and a voice thing. Sure. And, and we put it down as, as exactly that, but to a click. Mm -hmm. um, Program some beats behind it, and then at, at some point I just thought, oh, I know what I'm going to do with this. Yeah. And I flipped it, and it became, became this version. Right. 
Um, so there's a lot of, I mean, we were just talking before we went, started broadcasting, there's a lot of sub and bass elements. There are in this, in track. this particular the, track. The signy sub yep. that rolls underneath. There's an 808 pitch drop. That's right. There's a kick in the amen break. And the Juno as well. Yes. So yes. Maybe the, we could like solo those and like see how they work together and you could explain sure. a bit about mixing them. Yeah. So so this this bass, for instance, this is the subby one. Um, yeah, let me solo that. It's just, it's basically a sine wave. Um, it was a free Max for Live patch by this guy, Francis okay. Prive. Um, I think it's an operator patch, essentially, right. that, that he's built. And I tweaked it a bit. I don't know if you can hear it properly on, on these speakers or yeah. on, on the live feed, but yeah, it's a very subby um, tone following what the strings were doing mm -hmm. essentially and then um, it's kind of like a utility bass line it is yeah and oh, I the four, the and I've got this Fender Rhodes in there too which um, was kind of also it's not doing the bass but they're, they're low they're low yeah. notes um, so that was the idea with that sub was to follow that and then yeah when the beats came I added uh, a pitched um, 808, let me mm. solo it on its own because you couldn't really hear it. Which is classic to hit that on the one yep. with a drum and bass break. With the aim and break, for instance, mm -hmm. it, just, it just kind of, because it's such a long yeah. sub, it goes, you know, it's nearly, it's nearly uh, two bars long. Yeah, sure. So well, did you have to roll off a lot of the sub on one of them so that they didn't clash with each other? Do you know, um, I didn't have to roll off any sub of either of them. Nice. That's, but only because I, I knew that those two things would work through trial and error. Okay. So the first sub, this one, it, it does have quite a pop on the front of it. Okay, because I was going to say it sounds a bit saturated rather than a clean yeah. tone. It, yeah, it's a little bit dirty. It just starts to tweak. Yeah. And this 808 pitched kick, which is sub, is, is it's very round. Very pure, yeah. So those two things could, could sit together really well without having to get clever with any side chaining in particular. Okay. And um, that, would that be a tip you'd give them? Just m make your distinct... Make them more distinctive. Yeah, I mean, if if they were both in the realms of that, with you know the rounder sub, there would definitely have to be some side chaining yeah. so they could both exist in that space together. Mm -hmm. But because they're playing, they're, they're playing at the same time, but one, like you say, it's a bit saturated. It's just about breaking up, mm. um, so they could work. Yeah. And that's also, a, we'll bring that uh, bass line out on smaller speakers as well. Yeah, well. Giving it those harmonics. Yeah, yeah. So there's also a Juno in there as well, is that right? There is a Juno in here, uh, a 106 classic. And that's just a straight up accordion. Um, that is um, the Ableton um, uh, pack of, uh, what, they, what did they call it? All the little synths they did. Let's have a, a retro synths pack. Right. Yeah, that was the retro synths. Um, it's it's such a brilliant version of a Juno. I, I can't get enough of it. Yeah, it's yeah. called the June J U N hyphen. Subtle, yeah. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but so, I love this little thing. You know, it's much just like the real thing. As yeah, you know. sure. You've got one. I do you? indeed. One of six. I think we had a discussion. Yeah, about we did. That. So yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the great thing about the Juno again is, especially with that little noise, subtle yeah. noise, it brings it out in the mix. It does. Up the register and again. yeah, if, if I play that with the, the subby, right. yeah. They sound combined as one. Yeah, yeah, they thicken it. Yeah, you, you might, you might think that was one sound mm. if, if I hadn't told you or if yeah. you hadn't looked at the screen. So that was why I put that Juno in. Yeah, just to give it like you were saying, on smaller speakers, sure. to give it a chance to be heard. 
And the really, really low end was to be heard on a proper system. You know, on a proper big sound system. Which that would, you know, that would rattle any sound yeah. system. So your, your kind of tip for sub would be, instead of going straight for the side chain and for rolling things off and giving things a more defined frequency range, do un go most people, they tend to roll off the low end yeah. and let one thing sit there, but try thinking about the other end. Instead of rolling it off, bring it out sure. higher up instead. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is a combination of a few right. things, trial and error. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes if you were to only do that, it wouldn't work. Right. In this case, it does. Mm -hmm. Um, but not every time. So yeah, experiment. Leave leave all that low end in, and if it's okay, then there's no there's no need to get rid of it just because you think you've got to get rid of it. Okay. Sometimes I see people um, EQing out, you know, forty hertz because they think they've got to. You don't always have to because if there's there isn't any, there's no point in taking it away. Mm. Um, and then, you know, sometimes with, with an orchestra, you might EQ out those really low end things, but they're essential to that sound. Right. So trial and error, just experiment. And if you're making music with loads of bass in it, just, just live and breathe this yeah. until you really get it down. And would you have any tips for anyone who maybe is working on smaller speakers? Um, that wouldn't be able to translate the true sub 40, sub 50 hertz um, yeah. in terms of hearing it, just pop on, maybe pop on some headphones. You know. Headphones, um, you know, I know a lot of people work on headphones because it's a, a more accessible way to get that big sound. Yeah. Um, I find it hard to mix on headphones, personally. So my tip, if your speakers can't handle that really low stuff is is to just have the your monitor in it really low because then you will be able to hear it. You could even hear it probably on a laptop speaker if it was low enough. Mm. And gently turn it up in solo. And if it starts to to make the speakers just about break up, you know it's okay. Okay. If they're just going <laughs> distorting and they don't know what to do, it's too much, right. way too much. But if they just start to break up just that little bit. And would you recommend then that level being the monitoring level for the rest of the mix? For sure. Yeah. That's, that's your benchmark. Okay. You're not going to be able to go over that. And if that's all you've got, you have to deal with it. Yeah. That's, that's where it lies. You know, if you push too far, you've lost your mix. Mm. And if you're under that, you're not getting all the, the power that you probably could achieve. Okay. NS10s were I was how say, I learned uh, all of this. It sounds like a man who's learned on NS10. This is, this nice is how I learned all of it, yeah, because, you know, I was making a music for, for the dance floor and, um, and I was lucky enough to be working in a studio where we had massive main monitors, but also in his tents, like every studio. Mm -hmm. And it became really clear to me that if I couldn't hear this on an NS10, then it was, it was wrong. Right. I don't mean, you know, right or wrong, I just mean it wouldn't work in the mix. Yeah, sure. So there is a case to say that maybe having smaller speakers that can't reach that isn't necessarily a bad thing because it's not a bad they thing. wouldn't get you really excited in the studio and make you think that yeah. something's more exciting than it is. Sure. Yeah. I, um, when I'm teaching a mi the mixing class here, the, the kids always want to hear it on the bigger speakers because yeah. it makes them excited. And um, I try and, and insist on the NS10 being the benchmark for excited. Yeah. If they're making you excited, if the track's exciting you on the NS10, it's good yeah. and it's going to sound amazing or anything else. Yeah, because they're, they're not fun, are they? No, they're not no, fun, no. no. <laughs> you know what I was saying about the sub breaking up? Yeah. This sound here, this because it's slightly saturated, is sounding like a sub should on an NS10. It's kind of just starting to break up a little bit. Right. So yeah. So if you're hearing that with a sine wave, 
you're in good, you're in good way. Cool. Yeah. So maybe we can move on to the drums because you mentioned you start with the bass and the sub and then the beats together. Yes. So maybe we can have a look at the, yeah. the break. Uh, yeah, let me move that up there. So this was um, three versions, three different treatments of the Amen break, which I had for years. Mm -hmm. I collect the Amen break. Right. I, I love it, like lots of other people love it. Um, so I chopped it up, um, put it into a sampler, put it, I've got Persia at home and, and programmed it on there, but then I bounced it after. There's also, um, I just threw in for good measure a drum kit that I had recorded for, for a random, for a rock session actually. Mm. Um, so I threw that in there as well and it all sounds like this. So, and you know, the aim and break doesn't have the most bottom end in the world, as we know. Yeah. It, was, it is what it is. So, um, so I, that's why I put that 808 sub in on the one. So I layer that up. Um, and then I also programmed another kick um, in, and snare. Just to, just to add some weight to the aim and break. So they sound like this together. Um, which, and then I, I blended those together so that they mm -hmm. sounded like one drum. Cool. Um, and then, yeah, I, I put it in with, with this, this kind of saturated bass. I made sure that they were sitting together. So when you're balancing drums, do you always leave the bass going or would you do it in solo? Um, I would, I would probably, um, yeah, I'd have them both going. They both sit well together, those. Yeah. I mean, the aim and break, because it's so trashy and so mid, it's very easy to make this break sit in a mix. So let me pull it out of the mix. Push it in slowly. Too quiet. Sounds pretty good to me. And um, multi, but you've got multiband compression on the on the um, Amen. Yes, I is do. Is that something you'd reach for often with drums, or is it just a case of this particular track? Um, it's it's something I would reach for for a very percussive breakbeat. Like um, that. why is that? But let me show you. So without it in, it sounds like I'll take everything off here. Okay. This is this is actually a. A, a rack that I built, um, which I call push and shove drums. Let me just show you. So if I take the multi-band and the glue off, it sounds like this. Nice. Yeah. But then I wanted to bring out some of the, the kind of low mid stuff of that aim and break. So first of all, I, I put a glue compressor on it. Mm -hmm. And I have my ratio, you know, running at pretty heavy on, on glue. I don't know if you can see this on the screen. I've got it running at a ratio of 10. Right. Well, it attacks Almost pretty hard. Limited. Almost, yeah. 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 And then, you know, I dialed in the threshold, not too crazy. And my, my dry wet I've got running at 84. I kind of, I love this function of the glue compressor, this mm -hmm. kind of parallel yeah. option without having to go into setting loads of stuff up. It's just there straight away. So yeah, I'm running it pretty wet. There's only a bit of the original signal there. Um, so the multi-band, let me put that on next. So, as you can hear, the mid here, I'll solo the mid, turn it down, Yeah. put it back in the mix. I wanted more of that, essentially, 
and the multiband com compressor you can do upward and downward compression so I'm doing downward compression over the whole thing with glue mm -hmm. and then I'm combining some upward compression with the multiband dynamic and yeah. just bringing out that mid stuff there yeah. sounds a lot trashier I'll take them off yeah, there's a huge difference when you turn off the multi Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it sounds really trashy. Cool. And is multiband the kind of thing that you would learn on your mixing course? Yeah, you would, yeah. yeah. I would definitely touch on this. Yeah. Um, this. This particular one is specific to Ableton because upward compression is, is quite unusual. Yeah. Um, By upward so, compression, you mean making a band larger? Um, threshold. Well, compression usually works by taking all the, the stuff that's too loud and, and trying to push it a little bit, squashing it essentially to make the quiet stuff in effect sound louder. Yeah. Upward compression's the other way around. So it's making the quiet stuff sound louder without making the loud stuff quieter. Right, okay. It's kind of. In, with words, it's doing the same yeah. thing, but yeah, but they're very different when you listen to them. Okay. And um, the multiband dynamic, you can use both upward and downward compression at the same time just by doing that. I'm a big fan of that. Yeah. So yeah, I built this rack for these drums, and I can build them pretty quickly because I've done it so many times. Yeah, sure. But if, if somebody else wanted to, to build a rack, yeah, get, a, get hold of a glue compressor, a multi-band, anything else you want, put them all in there together. And there you go. That's, yeah. my, that's my drum effects rack. So speaking of racks then, I mean, you use the racks a lot in your mixes? Yeah, essentially they're presets, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I do use them a lot, yeah, but I'm very fast at making them. So sometimes I, if I'm in a situation where there isn't time or I don't have my, my external drive and I haven't got the racks with me, they're very fast to build. Um, so yeah, I have, one, I have one that I use all the time on, on the vocal for this particular guy, Charlie yeah. Brown. So let's have a look at that then. This is the, the vocal rack that you use across all, most of his tracks? For his stuff, right? yeah. I mean, every singer will have a different tone on, on a particular mic. Um, I found a mic that worked for Charlie. Right. I found an EQ setting that worked for him. I found a, um, a compressor setting that works for him and a nice reverb. Right. And so, because it was gonna be you, all the way through the album with this particular sound, yeah, I built an uh, effects rack just for him. And here it is. So this is what it consists of. It's the uh, exactly what I just said. So here's the EQ on his vocal. I'm I'm dipping some of the the low end because he's got quite a low boomy voice. And we used the uh, we ended up using an SM58 for this. Okay. Which as as a, as you know, it's a really basic simple mic. Mm -hmm. but with tools like this, EQ compression, you can get one of those mics to sound really sweet. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is the EQ setting for Charlie's vocal. And would you EQ before the compressor every time, or is it just a case of how does this sound? Moving I well? I would. Okay. Yeah, with a vocal, I'd EQ before the compressor, and then put it yeah post EQ. Because yeah. I'm an old school engineer. You yeah. see. Um, so maybe we can take a listen to that and see what sure. it sounds like if you just Let turn it off one by one. Yeah, okay, sure. Um, maybe that's, that's going to be easier said than done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's have a look. Holding on. This is our... Don't give it up, don't give it up if I ever let you go. Don't give it up, don't give it up. Let me see. Because I've got so many of these racks on. There we go. It's on this one. Let's put it on there for you. Sorry about this. Come to
to push and shove. Nobody's gonna love you better. No EQ. I take a look above, try to fly and hope it lasts forever. Sounds quite woolly, you know? And, yeah. And that's a 58 wood. Come to push and shove. Nobody's gonna love you better. So I took out some of the pops from yeah, that I take that. and I took some of the bottom away. So this is with the EQ in. Come to push and shove. Still some pop Nobody's there. gonna love you better. But the vocal's a bit lighter. I take a look above, try to fly and hope it lasts forever. I put the compressor in. Take a shot in the dark. It's quite so heavy you know compression whoa. again. I wanted the breath. No out. doubt in my mind, I've only some of the sibilants I wanted back. Ever sure. since I'm holding and it's on, not at 100% trying again. to forget. No, you're right. I'm, I've backed it off to about 88%. So there, yeah, there's some of the original signal going, but such a little bit of original yeah. signal. I might as well turn it all the way up. Yeah. I think that was for my own benefit. No one else Come is. To push yeah. So there we go. Nobody's going to love you better. Um, and I just wanted a nice, subtle reverb on this one. As I'm looking at this, this was just one of the standard wide ambience um, reverbs, but recently I've become a convolution reverb ah, yes. obsessive. So, because I haven't opened this track for uh, probably a month, that's why that's there. But when, when I leave this room, I will be changing. Replacing yeah, it. Yeah, because it's just incredible what yeah. that thing can do. Come to push and show. I mean, this sounds great Nobody's already. Nobody's gonna yeah. love. Thanks. Um, I mean, it doesn't sound bad. Yeah. But and is that the pre delay is quite long on that? Is that something you'd recommend on vocals? I I really it's a it's a thing for me. I love pre delays. Okay. Yeah, I like it coming after. I mean, pre delays for those who might not be familiar with it. It's putting the it's putting the re the reverb off for a certain amount of time. So yeah. it comes after. So come to push and shove. Kind of lets the original signal come through. Then the then it reverse activate, yeah. yeah. So it doesn't collide it too much. Yeah, the best example of somebody who loves pre delay would be George Michael. Right. If you've ever listened to any George Michael record, all the time. it will be going all the right. way through the vocal. So quite audibly as well. Very much so, yeah. yeah. I think he uses it to kind of shine. Right. He's to give his vocals a little bit of a shimmer. Yeah. So yeah, we are running out of time, so quickly Sorry, I just wanted yeah. to ask you about your master bus. Yes. Um, it's a very simple process. If you do want to learn more about reverb and, and pre-delays and all of that, make sure you uh, take a look at uh, the course that Sai teaches, which is yeah. um, mixing. Uh, art of art mixing, of mixing. Yeah. and I also teach engineering. Yeah, so well. if you want to learn more about that, uh, go check those out on our website. Um, so yeah, just quickly look at the master bus before we take sure. some questions. If you do have any questions, now is the time to get them in. Um, so my master bus. This, um, I've had conversations with, with various people who've been, have, yeah. who've been mixing <laughs> as long as I have and, and the way that mixing has changed now. Yeah. And, you know, in the past three or four years, it's become a very different process mm -hmm. to how it used to be when we were all just using analog gear. Now, you know, everybody is mixing inside the box. Yeah. Um, and I'm, most of my students are mixing in the box. Actually, all of them are. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I do anything with a mix, on goes my EQ8. That is my own personal setting. So I once had a, a good mastering engineer friend. I yeah. was like, what are you doing to my mixes? And basically, I'm, I'm giving you a tip here, people. That's what he did yeah. to my mix. It's the classic hi fi smile. Yes, it is. 70s smiley key yeah. to counteract, yeah. Yeah, just, you know, boosting, boosting some 120 and some, uh, you know, around seven and a half to eight thousand, and then dipping a little bit of two, two thousand, but with quite a big sweep on them. Yeah. So they're kind of generic. Yeah, sure. So I get that on straight away. And I and I put on a glue, my old favourite. Yeah. This is my. It's not a, much of a secret now, but it is my weapon of choice. Yeah. Because it's so usable. Um, so I put that on. 
I'm, I'm spanking it a bit here at 10, but I might have it at four right. in general, you know, but that will go on right plus, at the beginning. Yeah. And again, compressor after EQ. Yeah, 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 and this will go on um, even before I hit play. Right. I will set that up because um, if you do this later down the line when you've got your mix running, this is going to change everything mm. and your mix isn't going to sound as good as it was. So if it's on at the beginning, you're mixing with it. It's assisting you. And then, you know, when all is said and done at the end of the day, you can then go in and adjust things subtly. I'm running that at 100%. That. Yeah. <laughs> there's, no, there's no parallel there. Yeah, nice. Um, one thing that I, I just couldn't believe it when I came across it was if you control click on, on there, get this little oversampling and as standard that isn't on right and it's only for the EQ8 and for the and for the glue oversampling if you flick those on to oversampling it kind of gives them more processing power and it makes them sound even better than they were okay cool I it blew me away when I found out it's the difference subtle. Was you, yeah. yeah it's it's subtle but it's big right it's a big difference. Yeah, sure. So that's a good tip. Oversampling awesome. on your glue and your EQ8. Cool. So uh, we're running out of time, but thanks a lot. Um, Thank you for awesome. having Lots me. Of tips in there. I'm going to quickly jump to the YouTube comments to see if there's any questions, which there is. Um, so pork beans. Hi, pork beans. <laughs> that's a good name. <laughs> what, what kind of monitors would you recommend to hit the lows? So what we were talking about earlier about monitors with a bigger cone or whatever. Sure. Um, if you wanted to hear them, you don't care about NS10s, you don't care about accuracy. You, you just, just want to hear that bass. You just want to hear the bass. <laughs> Genelex. Genelex. Yeah. They're a bit shiny, but you're, you're going to hear some bass out of those. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And a, on a budget end, um, Rockets. Yeah, he's, okay. uh, someone else actually, James Dix, has asked yeah. around 200 to 300 quid, so that's where the Rockets, rockets. come in. Rockets. Yeah, Rocket 5s okay, okay. are, are what we've got here, yeah. and we can hear the sub. Yeah. Rocket 6s are, are a bit subbier still. Yeah, and uh, just quickly one more question before we uh, finish up. Uh, Shebenja Seincraft has asked, uh, so Live's multiband is an expander as well, so I guess... It's all sorts of things. Yeah. It's yeah. like a whole Friday Forum Live <laughs> yeah. thing. Good yeah. idea. Yeah, it is. It's... Um, it's amazing. Yeah. The the what what you get with live for mixing the tools are un unbelievable. Mm. All the stuff that I mixed on here is just native comes, plugins. Yeah, just live stuff plugins. Yeah, for the mix um, and yeah, so so usable. Yeah. Um, let's quickly. Oh, there's plenty of questions flying. We'll try and get through them. Do you use any return tracks? In your mixes, I guess that's more about parallel rather than. Um, I've shied away from it of okay. late. And the reason for that is because computers are, are so much more powerful now. Um, I know there's, some, there's also the argument of summing, mm -hmm. um, but I used to only bust stuff because cause my computer couldn't handle it. And now, you know, you can buy a little little MacBook and it will run all day long. Whatever you throw at it, it will run it. Yeah. So I've, I've shied away from, from bussing a little bit of late. Yeah. Um, I know people are very keen on teaching that because it's a, it's a traditional way of, of being a mix engineer. Yeah. Send that out on the orcs, bring it back in there. But things are, things are changing a little bit. Yeah. So I guess adapting, don't be afraid of adapting, just because you might not be doing it the right way doesn't sure. mean it's the wrong way. <laughs> it doesn't mean it's the wrong way. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, loads of questions coming in, we're going to try and get through them as quickly as I can. SM58 recorded vocals sounded a little nasal or muddy to me. Can you show us how the vocals sit in the mix? We already looked at that, so if you want to, you can rewatch this in like 10 minutes when we're finished, so you can go back sure. and have a look at how that was EQ'd. Um, quickly... Um, how do you feel about compression? NY compression on drums, which is also parallel compression. Yeah. Anybody who doesn't know that. 
Shit. Uh, so you like parallel compression? Or, well, I mean, I you're do. using it on the glue with the percent with the dry wet anyway. Yeah, yeah, the dry wet thing, which is essentially parallel compression. Yeah, I use I probably use the compressed signal more than the original one. Okay. So somewhere between yes. seventy five and hundred every time. Yeah, right? yeah, I do use it a lot, and the glue and a lot of the Ableton effects offer that parallel option with this wet dry. Yeah a standard, cool. which I so, love. So, we've got one more question. Um, unfortunately, we can't answer them all, but we are running out of time. Uh, someone's asked, I, 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 I want to work at Point Black Music School. How do I get a job? <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs> I, I, know. I, I don't know what the to say. The things we had to do to get this to job. To get though. this job. So yeah, uh, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, we are out of time. Um, if you want to find out more about uh, Sai's amazing mixing skills, you can check out his courses Art of Mixing and Sound Engineering. So that's right. right. That's right. And uh, if you want to see more about those courses, visit pointblanklondon.com or if you're not in London or the UK, uh, you can check, if you want to study online with us, it's online.pointblanklondon.com. And uh, we'll be back next week with another Friday Forum. So until then, make sure you like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. What is it? Put us in circles in Google Plus? And uh, all those other th great things, and we'll be feeding you with more tutorial until next Friday. So we'll see you then. Cheers.